Hey, Miriam, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you feeling? Doing good, doing good. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. I really want to talk a lot about your very well-rounded career, and there's a lot to cover here. Um, you have a really cool background. You know, you're a graduate of the Yale School of Drama, you know, no big deal, and you started performing off-Broadway, and I think that was really interesting. Um, do you have some of your favorite off-Broadway shows that you started doing before you jumped into television? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> well, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of roles that I absolutely love prior to uh, doing t starting to do TV and film. One was uh, D'Artagnan in The Three Musketeers. I did with Classical Theater of Harlem. Um, also, I did uh, Blanche Dubois in Streetcar Named Desire, actually in my third year yeah, at Yale. So I loved playing that role. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of Shakespeare, so... Um, I love playing Viola in Twelfth Night and uh, Eno Barbus in, um, in uh, Cleopatra. So yeah, I, I, have a, I have a whole plethora of characters that I fell in love with that I've played. Not, not just any actor can do Shakespeare. What draws you to specifically doing a Shakespeare? Um, I love the language. I love the language. As I mentioned before, you know, um, Anthony and Cleopatra, when I play Eno Barbus, there's just a beautiful um, language that every single character speaks. You know, they're all very different from one another. And I love the different nuances that they each have. And, you know, just how a lot of times the character's name is reflected in the language, you know, um, like Bolingbrook is the most recent character I played. Um, for this radio broadcast that's coming up actually for WNYC in conjunction with the public theater. And just to think of the name Bowling Brook, I mean, he's an individual that um, is, is, is becomes banished. And so the way that, you know, he comes back, it's like, I think of like a bowling ball, you know, just on a roll and um, the, it's spelled Bowling Broke. And so he essentially does become broke because all of his, everything that he has earned, everything he will inherit has been stripped away from him. And so, yeah, just thinking of broke and then bowling and bowling brook and bowling brook and the flow of water. And yeah, anyway, I'm going down. <laughs> well, I love it. But yeah. There's something very special about theater, you know, and parlaying that, you've made a wonderful transition into television with your new series, The Shy, which is yeah. on Showtime. Can you tell me about your character, Dre, and really, especially you taking that on, the importance of your role that it has in today's climate? Yeah, um, well, I think it's so imperative in today's climate because we're focusing on Black people and Black lives, Black stories. And I don't think we get that enough uh, within the industry. And, you know, even with commercials, it's like we just we just don't see enough variety, enough diversity. Um, but back to the shy. Yes, I play a character um, named Dre. And Dre is the newly um, she's the new wife to Nina, played by Tyler Abercrombie, who was the mother of Keisha and Kevin. So I come in, you know, I'm a new partner. Uh, you know, a new step parent with two teenage kids that, you know, are not that far from me, you know, like in age. And so it's just like, whoa, you know, this is crazy. I'm, I'm now a parent. I've never been a parent, you know, before uh, as the character. Well, me either. But, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just had to imagine what it would be like walking into that type of situation, you know, wanting to be a part of this family, wanting to love these kids with my full heart you know, and soul just as much as I do their mother. Um, and it's so important, I just think, to, to, to show that we can have family in this way, you know, family to look like this. You have two black women and, you know, two children. And it's fine. It's super dope to have that level of uniqueness. And why does everybody's family have to look the same? Why do we all have to have white picket fences? I mean, we can all have fences, but why do they all have to be the same color? You know, we can still have a sense of cohesion and um, unity, you know, but still be different. So I just really love that 
our family dynamic is different, but we're still a family. Um, I'm very supportive of Nina. You'll see throughout the season, we go through <laughs> a lot of different things. We kick off with a wedding and it's, it's you know, super uh, wonderful in the beginning. And then immediately things change and we have to deal with that. And we deal with that as a family. So Dre is, um, Dre's down for the ride. You know, she's focused on the family and really, I think just playing her part 100%. That's amazing. You know, I think it's so important to have those kind of role models on television portrayed in a very positive light, you know, and I had seen in one of your previous um, interviews, you said that you wanted it just to be like normal. It doesn't have to be, you know, portrayed in such a, such a level that it's like, here I am doing this important role. This is just normal. This is everyday life. And I, I think that's a beautiful way to explain it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I like to, my acronym for it is HOT, Honest, Open, and Truthful. Ooh. Yeah, you yeah. can borrow it. You, can borrow it. <laughs> you need to put a TM at the end of that. <laughs> yeah, just, I'm like, yeah, just give my credit. Um, but basically, yeah, I mean, it's this thing of film, TV, theater should reflect society. And so that's why we should see diversity. You know, I see male couples sometimes and they have one, two children, you know, little boys or little girls. And it's just like, that's dope. You know, Nate and Jeremiah, those interior designers, you know, it's like they have two little babies, you know, and it's just like, this is cool, you know? So on HGTV, you know, on Showtime, on Fox, on CBS, we have to see variety because that's what lives in the world. You know, we reside amongst each other, even if you have to walk a few blocks to get out of your neighborhood to get into the next, you know. So why not have more of a, a sense of community in terms of, you know, these stories that we're telling and how we show the dynamics, you know, of, of family and relationships. Absolutely. And not to go off on a tangent, but I have a three year old and there has been some really progressive cartoons, even through <laughs> PBS and I'm very impressed and Netflix I've been seeing some interesting ways that they're talking about these exact things but now to the younger generation I think it's just all about really acceptance and especially you know I wonder just from your viewpoint in your opinion you know as a publisher being in media what can we do to continue these positive stories that you would like us to do for you and also in the sense of what's going on in the world even around us with everything in general what sense of sense of responsibility do you put onto me as media well thank you that's a great question i think that um we have to continue to be a part of the conversation you know we have to in the same way that you know we are right now um you and i we're just having a chill conversation within that we'll find out the things that you know what are our commonalities you know what are the things that that are different you know about us that we can learn from one another you know i think it's it's really just about us being heard being heard being seen <laughs> you know just just not being treated like the invisible man you know we're here we've been here we're not going anywhere you know, everybody needs to understand that we were forced to be here. So now you're going to tell people they got to go, you know, it, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, and that's not funny, but you know, it's, it's really just, it's, it's been so ridiculous that there's hilarity there, you know, and it's just like, we need to really, I think just moving forward for these future generations, really get on the same page and get on the same page fast because we see what happens when there are energies that you know want to divide and that's not going to help us as a people mm -hmm. so yeah i think we have to engage one another in conversation and because you do have a platform because there are certain individuals you know um some of our a lot of our white counterparts that have more you know power i think that you have to now say okay you know what we want to be more inclusive like yeah why not you know why not that's perfect. You know, I want to ask you about also something, not only are you doing acting, mm -hmm. but you are a musician, you yeah. know, and you have that love for that. Can you tell me about the significance behind your musical moniker, Robin Hood, which is a really <laughs> cool name, by the way. 
<laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, when I was when I started writing in 2003, I was really trying to figure out, you know, who who I, I want, how, how I want people to receive me, uh, how I want to be perceived in this music industry and the name Robin Hood came because it's always really been about for me with my music um really making it about uplifting my community and really all communities but specifically the black community because um we've been marginalized so much that um you know I just wanted to kind of break through any of those you know negative stereotypes that constantly get put on us and just write about what I wasn't hearing, you know, on the radio. Um, and the idea of like Robin for the hood, you know, if I could put two, you know, words in between Robin Hood, it would be that. Because everything I feel like I do ultimately is is to uplift the community, to bring a sense of awareness, um, but also to really just, you know, motivate and encourage and to, to say, hey, I've been one of those kids. I grew up in an impoverished, you know, community, um, two-parent home, but also a product of, you know, divorce. I have a lot of siblings, you know. So I feel like, you know, when you grow up um, and you don't really have a lot at your disposal financially, because we have a lot in other ways, but not necessarily financially, you figure out how to push through, how to take negative energy and make it positive. And so, Robin Hood really just kind of came out of that, and. Um, yeah, I just I wanted to make music that was for the hood, for my community, but also has this sense of um, responsibility to do more and to try to uplift as a part of that as often as possible. So speaking of taking negative energy and turning it positive, what have you been doing right now during this quote unquote span of time that we have all free time, right? Yeah. Not free time. But uh, what are you doing as a creative person to stay creative, to stay motivated, and to use your the positivity that you have to to make that expand out even farther into the world? Well, I think speaking of the music, um, one of the major things I was able to do is to uh, finalize my EP, Alter Ego, which is on all platforms right now. It was released on this past Thursday, the 25th. And really, yeah, like, all the studios were shut down. I couldn't really go record anywhere. And I have, I now have a small like in-house studio, which I built, you know, during Corona <laughs> because I had time and, and space and, and energy. Um, so I, you know, got to those DIYs, but, you know, basically um, I was in a bit of a rut because I said, wow, how am I going to finish this project? And I had a very specific timeline as to when I wanted it to be released. And some of the studios, you know, slowly but surely started to open back up. I found a new studio home and I just said, yo, I got to get in here and just bang this out. You know, um, the EP has a combination of songs and skits. And so me being a, a multi-hyphenated artist in addition to the acting and the music, I'm also a voiceover artist. And so I wanted to add that element to the EP as well. So I just spent a lot of time in the studio these last you know few weeks and just grinding it out, you know, just saying if I have something that I need to accomplish, then I gotta just get to it and you know do what I have to do. So it's been a lot of this <laughs> a lot of this time knocking out this EP, writing, creating with my um, music producer for this pro this project, excuse me, Easto. So um, yeah, it's just been, it's been a busy time. You know, it's been quiet in some ways, but it's, it's been pretty busy. I've been working. <laughs> How much fun do you have being a voiceover actor? I feel like that'd be so much fun to be, to be yeah. able to be somebody behind something else, you know, and just <laughs> go crazy. <laughs> It's dope. I mean, you know, I recently worked on Steven Universe Future, which is mm -hmm. created by Rebecca Sugar. And I mean, I had a blast. It was dope. Like I worked on um, some of the episodes for the final season. And then I also worked on Steven Universe Unleash the Light, which is a video game. So, you know, I mean, to, to voice someone is really cool because you already see what they've created. You know, it's not like when you get you know, cast for something. And it's just like, oh, okay, you know, the person is obviously gonna look like you because your cast is the part unless we, you know, do something crazy. Um, 
but yeah, like we already kind of have a personality for this character. However, we need you to bring that personality, you know, to this character and the way that they look, the way that they move, it's just, you're learning about all those different nuances. And so you're just able to to come to it, you know, and just say, okay, now what else can I add to really breathe, you know, into this character? So I love it. I think it's super, <laughs> it's super cool. And you never have to know what I'm like, you know. <laughs> you like to do DIY, you said, with your, like your office and you mentioned- uh... Definitely. I can tell. I, you're, have you been watching a lot of? What do you? Where do you go to for your DIY stuff? Well, like what shows? Yeah, like what do you watch? Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned HGTV before. I like I like a lot of like the uh, island buying, you know, shows. Addicting, or, right? You said they're what addictive? They're addicting, yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. But yeah, those types of shows are just. You know, I've, I've been doing some house shopping, you know, so it's just like trying to figure out, you know, what are the best properties, you know, the best properties on the, the what, what do they always say? Um, yeah, the best, the best, the worst house on the best block. Yes, yes. So, so um, but yeah, I just, I, I watch all those shows. <laughs> yeah, when you have a creative mind, it's fun to use that to, to other elements, which you're obviously clearly doing. You know, I wonder from your perspective, your, with your talents that you're doing in so many different realms, you know, a lot of the people that watch our content are either mid-level career artists or also beginners. You know, what advice out of curiosity do you have that you often like to give? And I know you use that for your music, but what do you say to those creative young people that are, look up to you and admire you to have a career much like yours? Um, You know, I have to say, you just have to really push and persevere, you know, um, none of this stuff comes easy. None of this stuff comes quick. You have to put the time in and you have to invest in yourself. It's just like this blue wall, you know, that I have behind me. I do a lot of self tapes, you know, for auditions. And as opposed to going to a studio and paying somebody, you know, to do it, I'm able to do them home, you know, in my, you know, in my space. And, and all that took us just going to Home Depot and getting a little bit of blue paint, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I always say, you know, make sense of your situation. Like you just have to make it make sense for you, financial sense, mental sense, you know, um, discipline yourself. If there's something that you're doing that's getting in the way, you know what it is, you know, be done with that and work towards your, your ultimate goals, you know, and set goals for yourself. I think a lot of times we don't, we don't set enough goals for ourselves and we just wake up and we do the, you know, same thing every day, or maybe it's different things, but we're not getting, uh, we're getting the same result, you know? So I think it's a matter of really just getting specific, get specific. And then I heard um, Dave Chappelle say something recently. I was watching a Netflix, a Netflix special where he was receiving the Mark T Twain award, excuse me. And he just said, you know, be kind to everyone and be fearless. And I feel like I've been practicing that without necessarily hearing somebody say it, you know, but hearing him say it made me want to take that challenge on and say, you know what? Absolutely right. Be kind to people, you know, don't be a, a pushover, you know, but be kind to people and, and be fearless. Go after the things you want. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, out of curiosity, I know that you know how important the arts are. Yeah. In general, I, you're the last person I have to explain this to. But what do you hope to see more after, let's just, you know, this pandemic? How do we continue to support our arts on a local and a national level, considering that arts have been shut down and especially on Broadway? You know, what, what are some of your takes on that? I mean, you know, we have to have art. It's like, oh my gosh, we would be so bored if we didn't. <laughs> I mean, where where would you be if you had nothing to watch, if there were no drive-ins, you know, no no theater to attend? It's 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 absurd. You know, we have to have the arts. So even when I hear that like funding has been cut, you know, in different schools, I'm just like, are you kidding me? Like no, you have to have art class. You have to have a music class. You have to have you know, Jim, you have to have a writing, like we have to, we have to have all of these things. And 
you know, gym athletics, that's not necessarily a part about art. However, it is a, a skill set that, that you can hone and to take these things away. It's just like, whoa, you know, this is how we can become multi hyphenated because we are skilled at different things. We've been taught, you know, different ways, different skill sets. So then we can apply it in life moving forward. I can tell you're excited about that Shakespeare coming back in. <laughs> I love Shakespeare. <laughs> I love Shakespeare. Meanwhile, most actors are running for the hills. You're running towards it. It's awesome. I mean, you know, again, balance is, is, is all about balance. <laughs> well, how can we follow you? If people don't know about your music, how do we make sure to know all about what you have going on? Yeah, um, well, it's streaming on all platforms. It's Robin Hood is my uh, music moniker, Robin with a Y. And yeah, on Instagram, I'm Robin Hood Music. On Twitter, I'm Robin Hood Music. And also on Twitter, Miriam A. Hyman. And uh, yeah, same thing on Facebook, Miriam A. Hyman, Robin Hood Music. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm everywhere that everybody is. <laughs> awesome. so, yeah. Thank you so much for all your time and all your hard work that you put into being such a dedicated, well-rounded, creative person that everyone can look up to and admire. It's really amazing. Thank you so much. Definitely check out Alter Ego. Like I said, it's on all platforms. Robin with a Y. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.